It's 1979 and Atari dominates the video game world. Four talented developers slave away in their offices, creating hit after hit. But there's a problem, they get no credit, no royalties, and no respect. Fed up, they decide to do the unthinkable, they quit. Their names are David Crane, Alan Miller, Bob Whitehead, and Larry Kaplan. Four guys who risked everything to start their own company in an industry that didn't believe they could succeed. Their goal is to create the first ever third-party game developer for consoles. These rebels call their new venture Activision. It's a move so bold, so unprecedented, that Atari immediately slaps them with a lawsuit. But against all odds, these four disgruntled developers don't just survive, they thrive. Their games become massive hits, they revolutionize the industry, and they build a multi-billion dollar empire that still dominates gaming today. How did all this happen? Well, when you are ready, grab a cookie and hot chocolate, sit back, and join me in this deep dive into Activision's history. It's 1979 where bell-bottom jeans are still a thing, disco refuses to die, and four guys at Atari are about to flip the gaming world on its head. Little do they know, their frustration is about to birth an empire. In this year, Atari is the undisputed king of video games. Their Atari 2600 console sits in living rooms across America, introducing a generation to the joys of blocky graphics and beeping sounds. But behind the scenes, all is not well in the kingdom of joysticks and pixels. The environment at Atari is becoming increasingly stifling for its talented developers. The company's policy is clear. There is no individual credit for game creators. It doesn't matter if you've made the next Pong, your name isn't going on that cartridge. This lack of recognition isn't just a blow to egos. It has real-world consequences. With no public credit, these developers have no leverage to negotiate better salaries or working conditions. They're the invisible geniuses behind Atari's success. Enter our four protagonists, David Crane, Alan Miller, Bob Whitehead, and Larry Kaplan. These guys aren't just good at what they do. They're the creme de la creme of Atari's development team. Their games are raking in millions for the company. One day, a memo circulates around Atari. It lists the best-selling games from the previous year. David does some quick math and realizes the four colleagues were creating games that generated 60% of the company's total revenue, which came out to be $60 million for that year. But their salary, it's a measly $20,000. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. The four developers start having hushed conversations in the break room. They're fed up with the lack of recognition, the pitiful compensation, and the feeling that they're just cogs in Atari's machine. They decide to approach Atari's president, Ray Kasser, with a proposal. They want recognition for their work and fair compensation based on their games' performance. And what is Kasser's response? He reportedly tells them they're no more important to Atari than the factory workers assembling the cartridges. That's it, the final insult. At that moment, David, Alan, Bob, and Larry make a decision that will change the course of gaming history. In August 1979, the four walk out of Atari's offices for the last time. They leave Atari and decide to start their own company. On October 1st, 1979, they officially found their new company. They initially call it Computer Arts Inc., but quickly realize that sounds about as exciting as a spreadsheet simulator. After some brainstorming, they settle on Activision. It's a combination of active and television, which perfectly captures their vision of interactive entertainment. Oh, and you bet they had to jab at Atari one last time. They made sure the name they chose would show up first alphabetically before Atari. Now comes the tricky part. These guys want to make games for the Atari 2600, but there's a teensy problem. Nobody has ever made third-party games for a console before, and Atari is not exactly rolling out the welcome mat. A big question when creating a company is whether it will be an LLC, a partnership, or a corporation. The group has mixed ideas of where they see Activision in the future. Two main options are either become a consulting company that works with Atari, or become a corporation that is Atari's competition. So they meet with an attorney to work out these details. The attorney they end up meeting with has a good friend that has been trying to get a software company off the ground, unsuccessfully. This friend has an investor lined up, but is missing the proper business plan. This is great news for Activision. The attorney explains their vision of creating games for a console they don't own to his friend. It's a tough sell, but they manage to secure about $1 million in funding. That's enough to get the ball rolling, but in the world of game development, it's not exactly a fortune. 
Regardless, with cash in hand, the team gets to work. They're creating an entire business model from scratch, so they need to figure out manufacturing, distribution, marketing, all while actually developing games good enough to compete with Atari. The industry reacts to Activision with a mix of skepticism and outright hostility. Atari, unsurprisingly, is not thrilled. They see Activision as a threat and respond with legal action, accusing the new company of stealing trade secrets. Despite the legal challenges, Activision pushes forward. In 1980, they released their first batch of games. The games hit the shelves in brightly colored boxes that stand out from Atari's offerings. It's a bold statement. Activision is here and they're not trying to blend in. Gamers start to take notice of these new titles. The graphics are better, the gameplay is innovative, and hey, there are actually credits on the box telling you who made the game. It's a revolutionary concept in the industry. Dragster, created by David, becomes an instant hit. It's a simple racing game, but it's addictive as heck. Players can't get enough of revving their engines and trying to shave milliseconds off their times. Boxing, another early hit, shows that Activision isn't a one-trick pony. The game offers a level of detail previously unseen on the console. Players can actually see their boxers' faces. It's not exactly photorealistic, but in 1980, it's mind-blowing. These early successes put Activision on the map, but they're just the opening act. In 1981, the company releases a slew of new titles, including Freeway, Kaboom, and Laser Blast. Each game further cements Activision's reputation for quality and innovation. But 1982 is when Activision truly hit the jackpot. David, already a star developer, creates a little game called Pitfall. Players control Pitfall Harry as he swings on vines, jumps over crocodiles, and collects treasure. It's like nothing anyone has seen before. Pitfall becomes a massive hit, selling over 4 million copies. It's not just popular, it's culturally significant. Pitfall Harry appears on t-shirts, lunchboxes, and even gets his own Saturday morning cartoon. Activision has created its first true franchise. 1982 also sees the release of River Raid. It's a vertically scrolling shooter that pushes the Atari 2600 to its limits. The game is not only fun, but technically impressive, featuring procedurally generated terrain. It's a first for home consoles. By the end of 1982, Activision has gone from industry outsider to a major player. They've proven that third-party development isn't just viable, it's the future of the industry. Atari is still the big dog, but Activision has shown that even big dogs can be taught new tricks. The gaming world will never be the same. Welcome to 1983, where Activision's riding high, but they're about to learn that in the game industry, what goes up must come down. And boy, is it coming down. The video game crash of 1983 hits like a ton of unsold ET cartridges. It's partly Activision's fault. It showed the world that third-party game development is the way forward. Now, third-party game developers have flooded the market and have chosen to focus on quantity instead of quality. Suddenly, the market is flooded with low-quality games from companies trying to cash in on the craze. Consumers lose confidence and sales plummet. Activision, despite its quality titles, isn't immune to the crash. Their quarterly revenue drops from $50 million in mid-1983 to about $5 million by the end of 1984. It's a staggering fall, and the company is forced to lay off staff, going from about 400 employees to just 95 in that period. Realizing that putting all their eggs in the console gaming basket is no longer a smart move, Activision begins to diversify. They start developing games for home computers like the Commodore 64, Apple II, and Atari 8-bit computers. It's a smart pivot, but it's not enough to completely shield them from the industry's crash. The company's troubles aren't just external. By 1988, Activision has seen significant changes in leadership. The original founders have all departed, with David, who was the last to leave, exiting in 1986 to help form Absolute Entertainment. In a bid to rebrand and distance itself from the tumultuous video game market, Activision changes its name to Mediagenic in 1988. The idea is to position the company as a broader software provider, not just a game company. It's a risky move that shows just how dire the situation has become. Under the Mediagenic name, the company tries to reinvent itself as a jack-of-all-trades. They're not just making games anymore. They're diving into the thrilling world of business applications. Because if there's one thing gamers love, it's spreadsheets, right? 
the company releases a line of productivity software, including titles like 10.0 and Activision presentation tools. Yep, it's about as exciting as it sounds. Turns out, though, the skills that make great video games don't necessarily translate to creating business software. Meanwhile, Mediagenic doesn't completely abandon games. They continue to publish titles under the Activision label, including a CD-ROM version of The Manhole in 1989. It's one of the first games available for PC CD drives, but it's not enough to turn the tide. The company's finances continue to spiral. The shift to business software isn't paying off, and the gaming division is struggling to recapture its former glory. By 1990, Mediagenic is in a dire situation. The company is drowning in debt, and its attempts to diversify have largely failed. The name change hasn't fooled anyone, least of all the creditors knocking at the door. The situation comes to a head in 1991, when Mediagenic reports a staggering loss of $26.8 million on revenues of just $28.8 million. With over $60 million in debt and no clear path forward, Mediagenic files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The once mighty Activision, pioneer of third-party game development, is on the brink of collapse. As 1991 draws to a close, it seems like the end of the road for the company that once revolutionized the gaming industry. But sometimes, when things are at their darkest, a hero emerges. And in this case, that hero, or anti-hero, is about to arrive in the form of a young, controversial entrepreneur named Bobby Kotick. It's 1991 and Mediagenic is in bad shape. Bobby Kotick, a young entrepreneur, looks at this debt-ridden, nearly bankrupt company and thinks, now that's a fixer-upper. Clearly, Bobby's got a vision. Bobby, all of 28 years old, sees potential in Mediagenic. He's not interested in business software or CD-ROM adventures. No, Bobby sees the value in the Activision name and its legacy of hit games. With the backing of his investor group, Bobby acquires a controlling interest in Mediagenic for the bargain price of $500,000. That's right, he buys a once mighty game company for less than the cost of a modest home in Los Angeles. This is a bargain since the Activision name is worth over $50 million despite the actual company, Mediagenic, going bankrupt. Bobby wastes no time in implementing changes. His first order of business is aggressive cost cutting. He slashes the workforce, reducing the company to a skeleton crew of just eight employees. It's brutal, but Bobby's not here to make friends. He's here to save a company. Next, Bobby moves the company headquarters from Silicon Valley to Los Angeles. It's a symbolic move as much as a practical one, a fresh start in a new city. Plus, being closer to Hollywood might come in handy for future game licensing deals. In a move that surprises no one who's been paying attention, Bobby decides to ditch the Mediagenic name. In 1992, the company officially returns to its roots, becoming Activision once again. With the rebrand, Bobby refocuses the company solely on video games. No more business software, no more distractions. Activision is going back to what it does best, making games that people want to play. To jumpstart this new era, Bobby leverages Activision's back catalog. The company releases The Lost Treasures of Infocom, a compilation of classic text adventure games. It's a smart move, capitalizing on nostalgia while reminding people of Activision's gaming history. Bobby's strategy begins to pay off. By focusing on games and cutting costs to the bone, Activision starts to climb out of its financial hole. It's not an overnight success story, but slowly and steadily, the company begins to regain its footing in the industry. In the mid-90s, Activision starts to hit its stride with licensed games. They secure the rights to Spider-Man, and suddenly, the Spider-Man games become huge hits, proving that licensed properties can be more than just quick cash grabs if done right. In 1999, Activision releases Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and it's like they've struck gold. The game becomes a massive hit, spawning a franchise that will define skateboarding games for years to come. And suddenly, every kid wants to be a skater. The success of these licensed games gives Activision the financial cushion it needs to take bigger risks. They're no longer just surviving, they're thriving. And Bobby the strategist is already planning the next big move. That move comes in 2003 with the launch of a little game called Call of Duty. Developed by Infinity Ward, a studio Activision had acquired in 2002, Call of Duty drops players into intense World War II battles. It's an instant hit, and little does anyone know, it's the start of what will become one of the biggest franchises in gaming history. As Call of Duty takes off, Activision doesn't rest on its laurels. 
they continue to acquire talented development studios. In 2001, they snag up Treyarch, the studio that will go on to develop many future Call of Duty titles. It's a move that ensures a steady stream of high-quality games in the franchise. But the acquisitions don't stop there. In 2006, Activision buys Red Octane, the company behind the insanely popular Guitar Hero franchise. Suddenly, Activision is leading the charge in the music game craze that's sweeping the nation. By the mid-2000s, Activision has transformed from a company on the brink of collapse to one of the biggest players in the industry. They're releasing hit after hit. It's a stark change from the days of struggling to sell business software. The company's success doesn't go unnoticed on Wall Street. Activision's stock price soars, and they become a dream for investors. Bobby Kotick, once seen as a young upstart, is now hailed as a visionary CEO who turned a failing company into a juggernaut. As the 2000s draw to a close, Activision stands at the top of the gaming world. They've got successful franchises, a stable of talented development studios, and a clear vision for the future. But the biggest moves are yet to come. The stage is set for a series of mergers that will create one of the largest gaming companies in the world. We've reached the part of our story where Activision goes from everyone's favorite underdog to that guy at parties nobody wants to talk to. It turns out, when you're on top of the gaming world, there's a lot of people looking up at you and not all of them are cheering. As Activision's success grows, so do whispers about the company's work culture. Reports begin to surface about developers being overworked, particularly during crunch periods before game releases. These allegations paint a picture of a company pushing its talent to the brink. Long hours, high stress, and burnout become common complaints. Suddenly, the dark side of making hit games is out in the open. But it's not just the rank-and-file developers feeling the heat. In 2010, Activision finds itself in a very public dispute with the creators of Call of Duty, Jason West and Vince Zampella, the heads of Infinity Ward. They are fired by Activision for breaches of contract and insubordination. The timing of the firings is suspicious, as Activision allegedly owed substantial royalty payments to Jason and Vince in the weeks leading up to their firing, estimated to total around $36 million. What follows is a legal battle that rocks the industry. Jason and Vince sue Activision for unpaid royalties and control of the Call of Duty brand. Activision countersues, accusing the pair of trying to poach staff for a new studio. The dispute eventually settles out of court in 2012, but the damage to Activision's reputation is done. The company that once positioned itself as the champion of developers now looks like the big bad corporation. Meanwhile, Activision faces growing criticism over its strategy of annualizing franchises. Every year brings a new Call of Duty, a new Guitar Hero, a new Tony Hawk. Critics argue this leads to burnout, both for developers and players. The annualization strategy becomes a double-edged sword. While it ensures a steady stream of revenue, it also leads to accusations of stifling creativity and prioritizing profits over innovation. In December 2007, Activision announces an upcoming merger that makes jaws drop across the gaming world. They're joining forces with Vivendi Games, the parent company of Blizzard Entertainment. The deal values the new company, dubbed Activision Blizzard, at a whopping $18.9 billion. It's a staggering amount that reflects just how big the gaming industry has become. Bobby Kotick, still at the helm, is about to level up to super CEO. The merger brings together two powerhouse portfolios. Activision brings Call of Duty, Guitar Hero, and Tony Hawk. Blizzard contributes World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Destiny, and Diablo. When the dust settles, Vivendi ends up owning about 52% of the new company. But Bobby remains as CEO, ensuring that the Activision spirit and his vision will continue to guide the company. The newly formed Activision Blizzard immediately becomes the largest game publisher in the world. They're now playing in every major gaming market, console, PC, and the rapidly growing online space. One of the crown jewels of this merger is World of Warcraft. At the time, it boasts over 10 million subscribers, each paying a monthly fee. It's a cash cow to say the least. The merger also gives Activision Blizzard a strong foothold in the Asian market, where Blizzard's games are incredibly popular. It's a global expansion that positions the company to dominate not just in North America and Europe, but worldwide.
But not everything is sunshine and rainbows. In 2018, Activision Blizzard starts facing serious questions about its workplace culture. Reports surface of a frat boy culture with allegations of gender discrimination and sexual harassment. The situation explodes in July 2021 when the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing files a lawsuit against Activision Blizzard. The suit alleges a culture of constant sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination. It seems Activision Blizzard has been playing a game of how not to run a company and just hit the high score. In response to these allegations, Activision Blizzard employees take action. On July 28, 2021, workers stage a walkout to protest the company's handling of the lawsuit and its response to the allegations. It's not just a few disgruntled employees. We're talking about hundreds of workers across multiple studios. The walkout isn't a one-time thing either. Employees continue to speak out and organize, forming advocacy groups like the ABK Workers Alliance. As if legal troubles and employee unrest weren't enough, Activision Blizzard soon finds itself in the crosshairs of government agencies. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, launches an investigation into how the company handled reports of misconduct. And the bad news keeps coming. In September 2021, the National Labor Relations Board accuses Activision Blizzard of violating labor laws. The charge is allegedly threatening employees and enforcing a social media policy that conflicts with workers' rights. Amidst all this, Bobby Kotick, the CEO who once saved the company, finds himself under intense scrutiny. Reports surface alleging that he knew about and failed to report multiple incidents of sexual misconduct. The controversies take a toll on Activision Blizzard's business. Partners like Sony and Microsoft distance themselves from the company. Some sponsors pull out of Overwatch and Call of Duty leagues. Despite all these challenges, however, Activision Blizzard's games continue to perform well. Call of Duty remains a bestseller, and World of Warcraft maintains a dedicated player base. It's a strange scene, a company in turmoil producing games that millions still love to play. But the twists are not over. On January 18th, 2022, Microsoft announces its intention to acquire Activision Blizzard for a cool $68.7 billion. That's billion with a capital B. The deal values Activision Blizzard at 95 per share. The news sends shockwaves through the gaming world. Microsoft, already a major player with its Xbox division, is now poised to become the third largest gaming company by revenue, right behind Tencent and Sony. But not everyone's thrilled about this supersized acquisition. Sony, Microsoft's chief rival in the console wars, starts raising concerns. They worry that Microsoft might make popular franchises like Call of Duty exclusive to Xbox, potentially tilting the playing field in Microsoft's favor. As 2022 progresses, regulatory bodies around the world start eyeing the deal with more suspicion. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority, CMA, launches an in-depth investigation concerned about the deal's impact on the gaming market. Meanwhile, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, FTC, isn't sitting on the sidelines. In December 2022, they file a lawsuit to block the acquisition, arguing that it would enable Microsoft to suppress competitors in gaming. Despite these hurdles, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard push forward. They extend the merger agreement's deadline and make concessions, including a 10-year deal to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation. It's a bit like offering to share your toys so the other kids won't kick you out of the playground. The tide starts to turn in 2023. In July, a U.S. federal judge denies the FTC's request for a preliminary injunction to halt the deal. It's a major victory for Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, clearing a significant obstacle in their path. Finally, on October 13th, 2023, after nearly two years of regulatory battles and negotiations, the deal closes. Microsoft officially acquires Activision Blizzard, creating a gaming powerhouse that spans console, PC, and mobile markets. As the dust settles, the gaming world looks very different. The scrappy startup that four Atari refugees founded in a garage is now part of one of the world's largest tech companies. It's a new chapter for Activision Blizzard, one that promises to reshape the gaming landscape yet again. As gamers everywhere boot up their consoles and PCs, one question remains. What's next in this epic saga? Activision's journey from underdog to top dog is the stuff of gaming legend. They started as rebels, daring to challenge Atari's monopoly. Now they're part of Microsoft, a tech giant so big it probably has its own gravity. 
The impact Activision has had on gaming history is hard to overstate. They pioneered third-party game development, revolutionized the idea of giving credit to developers, and created franchises that have defined generations of gamers. From Pitfall to Call of Duty, Activision's games have been shaping the industry for over four decades. But Activision's legacy isn't just about the games, it's about the business of gaming. They showed that video games could be big business, paving the way for the multi-billion dollar industry we see today. Bobby Kotick's aggressive business strategies, for better or worse, have become a blueprint for success in the gaming world. Whether you're a fan or a critic, there's no denying that gaming wouldn't be what it is today without Activision. And as they embark on this new adventure with Microsoft, one thing's for sure, the game is far from over. And that brings us to the end of Activision's current history. Now tell me in the comments what you think of Activision. And did you know its story? If you enjoyed diving into the rise of Activision, then you'll definitely want to learn how two ex-Tencent employees created China's first AAA game. I'll see you there. As always, please remember to like the video if you enjoyed this deep dive into Activision's past. Subscribe if you loved it. And let me know in the comments what other gaming company histories you'd like to see me cover next. Until next time, friends.